Dead America, Seattle Part 8 Dead America, The Northwest Invasion, Book 10 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Day Zero Plus 26 Are you sure you want to bet all your chips? Marcus raised an eyebrow, tapping the back of his fanned-out cards. Don't want you to go hungry now. Skylar's tongue darted out, and she wet her lips, smirking. That sounds like a man afraid to call, she teased. You'd have to dip into the sour cream and onion to match this bet. Sporadic gunfire still echoed in the distance, a constant reminder that there was still hope in this shit show. Okay, he said with a sigh, shoving the rest of the sour cream and onion chips into the center of the patio table. I'll call. Read em and weep she declared, laying down a full house. Marcus groaned, picking up a rippled barbecue chip out of what was left of his pile and munching on it to soothe his loss. I really thought you were bluffing, he admitted through a mouthful of fried potato. When will you ever learn? Skylar replied, rolling her eyes. We've been together for years and you still can't see through my poker face. She grabbed the cards and began to shuffle them idly, leaning back in her chair. He chuckled. Your poker face is what hooked me in in the first place, remember? He took a small sip of the cold tea they'd managed to brew on the windowsill over the course of a few days. You wiped the floor with those guys back in college. Oh my god, I forgot about that, she replied, laughing. Jamie got so mad that night because he was trying to impress some sorority girl. He shook his head. And you were just cool as a cucumber as he threw a drunken temper tantrum he said wistfully. I'm pretty sure I fell in love with you on the spot. Is that why you asked me out that night? She fluttered her eyelashes at him. Because I can beat the boys at their silly games? He shook his head, reaching over to cover her hand with his. No, he replied. Because the silly games didn't affect you in the slightest. And that's why I said no to the silly drunken guy asking me out at a frat party, she replied with a twinkle in her eye. Marcus put a hand to his chest. That hurt, he admitted with an overdramatic pout. Hey, Skylar said, pointing a finger at him. At least I wasn't a total snow queen. I told you to ask me again when you were sober, because I didn't think you really meant it. He grabbed her finger and brought it to his mouth, giving it an affectionate kiss. But I did mean it, he said. I just needed the booze to give me the courage to ask. Silly boy she teased, and leaned in to peck him on the lips. Before she pulled away, she snatched one of his barbecue chips and shoved it in her mouth, leaning back in her chair with her prize. You fight so dirty, he moaned. She winked playfully. Don't you forget it, babe. You know, we should probably bag these up before they get stale and cook something real to eat, Marcus said with a sigh, smacking his thighs before he got to his feet. If we have anything real left... Skylar got up, slipping the deck of cards back into its cardboard case. Pork and beans it is, she declared. They took a moment to look over the edge of the patio, watching the river of zombies fourteen stories down move towards the noise in the distance. You think eventually they'll just all clear out, she wondered, running a hand through her long brown hair. Just all of them wander out towards the lake and leave everything this close to the interstate empty. He shrugged. I don't know, he trailed off, looking out to the water. Their condo, the Lakeview High Rise, stood tall at eighteen stories above South Lake Union, five blocks from the shore. They'd spotted boats in Lake Union a few days prior, and hadn't been sure if they were civilian or military. However, with all the gunfire happening, they were pretty sure it was the latter. I hope they can deal with it all, so they can come get us, she mused as she gathered up all the chips and shoved them back into the large sealable bag they'd been keeping the last of their salty snacks in. They're the military. They'll never run out of ammo, right? Marcus reached over and pulled her against him, curling an arm around her waist. I'd hope that if they're sending boats in to fight them, that they came prepared, he replied and leaned in to plant a kiss on the top of her head. Now, how about them beans? Oh, am I cooking for you, Mr. Man? she asked, blinking up at him with a playfully defiant look on her face. Send the woman to the kitchen. Should I go barefoot? 
he swatted her backside, sending her giggling in through the patio door. He could wear nothing at all, he suggested, waggling his eyebrows. Oh, yeah, she replied, rolling her eyes as she pulled a can out of the cupboard. Super sexy, naked bean cooking. He winked at her as he set up the little gas camping stove they'd been using since the apocalypse began. Everything you do is sexy, he assured her. She opened her mouth to retort something back, but before she could, an explosion rattled the windows. Chapter 2 What the hell was that? Skylar cried, frantically looking out the patio door to see what had exploded in the distance. Marcus headed for the front door of the condo. I think it came from the other side, he said. Let's check across the hall. He threw the door open and entered the condo across the way, which had been empty pre-apocalypse, even devoid of furniture. The couple burst out onto the patio and clutched the railing, staring wide-eyed at the plume of smoke rising from Volunteer Park. Troops poured down the interstate, guns blazing. They're coming this way, Skylar cried, pumping her fist into the air. Fuck yeah, Marcus added and wrapped his arms around her waist, swinging her around in a circle. They laughed and kissed, happiness radiating from them almost as if they weren't standing on a high-rise above a sea of walking corpses. High on hope and adrenaline, they turned back towards the interstate, staring at the approaching army. Skylar was first to sober a bit, however, as she looked down at the glass siding of the patio. A jagged line zigzagged across it, she turned around, looking at the windows of the condo, cold dread sinking over her when she saw the weakened panes of glass. Marcus, she said hoarsely, face rapidly losing color. He turned around, goofy smile fading from his face, and his brow furrowed when he realized what she was looking at. Shit, he breathed, his own expression sobering. Their building had at one time been a convention hotel, before it had been repurposed into luxury condos five years prior. The convention center on the main floor had been modified into massive amenities, like a giant pool and a gym with courts for all manner of sports. When people started getting sick, the whole convention center had become a makeshift rescue center for people, before anyone had known about blood type or infections or how the outbreak worked. The high-rise was sitting on top of a sprawling building full of thousands of flesh-eating zombies. And now the windows were cracked. We need to talk to Jax, Marcus said firmly, and grabbed Skylar's hand. The couple took off back into the condo and tore down the hallway together. They thundered down the stairs to the twelfth floor, and then paused to take a look at the barricade they'd built. Couches and TV stands and recliners piled up to the ceiling everything they'd been able to throw down there. How's it look? Skylar whispered as Marcus leaned over the railing to check the activity below. He tilted his head back and forth. There were dozens of zombies still down there on the other side, but at least they weren't pressing up against the barricade. As good as it needs to look, he replied quietly, and then turned around to the stairwell door. They headed down the hallway on the twelfth floor and found the condo they'd been looking for. Marcus turned the knob, finding it unlocked, and the duo burst inside. Jack startled as they tore into his condo, looking up from his ham radio set up in the middle of the living room. He unlocked the brakes on his wheelchair and backed away from the table a touch, turning to face the fear-stricken duo. "'Can you hang on a sec, Lennox?' he asked, and set down the mouthpiece for his radio. Marcus crossed the room to the patio door, Jax's condo, being on the east side, had been privy to the blast, and the glass door was completely shattered, shards littering the carpet. "'Are you okay?' Skylar asked, wringing her hands as she approached the wheelchair-bound man. "'Did you see the explosion?' He nodded. "'Yeah, I'm okay. Wasn't near the windows when it happened,' he replied. "'Any damage on your side?' "'No, but everything's cracked across the hall.' Marcus replied, turning back from the patio. Looks like the military's finally shown up. They're marching up the interstate. It looks like they blew up the park. 
Jax's eyes lit up. The cavalry's arrived, huh? But the main floor, Skylar trailed off, her voice cracking. If those windows are broken... The wheelchair-bound man shook his head. They won't be broken, he assured her. The convention center probably has safety stuff, so not as fragile as ours. He tilted his head back and forth. But they could be weakened. I wouldn't want to bet on them holding with a thousand of those things banging on them. We need to warn them, Marcus said firmly, jerking a thumb over his shoulder in the general direction of their rescuers. They're going to get overrun if the convention center can't hold. Skylar swallowed hard. But how? She shook her head. We haven't been able to get lower than this floor. There's too many of those things. Even if we could figure out how to get to the main floor, we don't know how packed it is down there. I don't think we could even get through there, let alone get outside and get to the interstate. Marcus turned and stared out the broken door, chewing his bottom lip. I don't think there's an efficient way to signal them from here, or even from the top floor, he mused. I mean, we could let them know we're here, but I don't know how we could convey the probable danger. I can try to convince Lennox to go, Jack said, rubbing his chin. He's not going to want to. Well, we'll have a bit of time to convince him, Marcus said, pointing through the door. Looks like these boys are going to have their hands full for the next little bit. Skylar approached him, sliding her arm into the crook of his elbow and holding on tight. A huge pack of zombies staggered up the interstate towards the army, and it wasn't long before gunfire cracked in the distance. I'm afraid to hope, she admitted quietly. He leaned over and planted a kiss on top of her head affectionately. Do you remember the last marathon we ran? he asked, turning her away from the window to face him. When the last week before we saw Brad Perkins training? Ugh, Brad fucking Perkins, she scoffed, rolling her eyes. Marcus smiled, watching her shoulders relax a little as her mind flipped to her memories, instead of their possible impending doom. He was such a dick that day, and bragging about his speed, he reminded her even though we already knew his stats. Everybody on social media knows his stats, she muttered. I would have respected his accomplishments if he hadn't been such a jerk face. And you told me that you were afraid to hope to beat him, he said, giving her hand a reassuring squeeze. She shook her head. This isn't a good analogy, babe, she said. He beat us that marathon. Yes, but a teenage girl threw a milkshake in his face when he did. Marcus reminded her with a smirk. Skylar chuckled. That was pretty satisfying. And even though we didn't win, we still raised a ton of money for Kid's Wish, he added, cupping her cheek. We did a lot of good that day. Do you see what I'm getting at? She sighed. That even if we die horribly, our actions might still help people? She asked. I mean, well... He trailed off, wrinkling his nose. I guess that's one interpretation. My point was that there could be unexpected victory despite things not going exactly according to plan. She offered him a smile, leaning into his palm. Thanks, she replied. It does make me feel a bit more confident. He wrapped her in a hug, resting his chin on her head as he watched Jack's roll back over the ham radio. The wheelchair-bound man took a deep breath and picked up the receiver. You still there, Lennox? he asked. Yeah, bud. You okay? came the strained reply. Yeah, I mean, as well as I can be, given the circumstances, Jack said. We need your help. This is... No, Lennox said, voice breathy and panicked. No, I can't help anyone. That explosion has my head spinning. I don't even know which way is up, man. What am I supposed to do to help anyone? Jack swallowed hard. That explosion weakened all the windows in our building, he explained. The convention center on the main floor is about a thousand of those things inside, and if they push hard enough, they're going to get out. We need to warn the military, or else they're going to get overrun, and that means no rescue for us. No, no, came the immediate reply. I can't do that. Jack shook his head. But you can, he said calmly. I know you can. You didn't think you could survive in the early days of all of this. But I knew you could. And guess what? You're still alive. 
I wouldn't have without you helping me, Lennox insisted. I would have been fucked in the first twenty-four hours if you hadn't have guided me. Jax nodded. And I'm guiding you now still, he replied. I know you can do this. There was a long pause, and then his friend finally asked, What about the others? The other people you helped? The wheelchair-bound man lowered his gaze. There's only one left, and he's too far away to make it in time, he explained. Everyone else. Everyone else is gone. Lennox groaned in frustration through the radio, seeming to war with himself. I know it's difficult, Jax continued gently. I can't even begin to understand what you're going through, what you've been going through since the start of all of this. This is the only way to save lives. You're the only one who can help them. Another long pause. Okay, he finally said, eliciting triumphant smiles from the trio in the room. I'll do it. Chapter 3 Lennox buried his face in his hands as the gunfire cracked in the distance. Images of bleeding and gutted bodies flicked through his mind, the screams of his comrades echoing in his brain like a chant of death. Muzzle flashes, explosions, the stench of shit and mud and copper mingling together in a heady cocktail of despair. The explosion in the park had nearly sent him into a spiral, but instead of running to the closet, he'd run to the radio. He'd known that his one chance at a lifeline was Jack's, the guy had been the guardian angel against his demons throughout this whole ordeal, not only having guided him home throughout the early days, but just being there for him as a friend, keeping him from falling into himself and becoming lost forever. And now, now Jax was counting on him. Pull your shit together, Lennox, he urged himself. Lives are at stake. If you don't want these military boys to suffer, you have to help them. Stealing his resolve, he scrubbed his hands down his face and got to his feet. He looked around at his fortress, the house he'd barricaded himself in, the house that had protected him from those flesh-eating monsters outside. Okay, he muttered to himself, running his hands through his hair. You're ten blocks south of the park. Gotta gear up and get the fuck moving. He headed to his closet, the one holding all of his old gear. It was a particular closet that he hadn't opened in a long time, but it was time to face that fear and trepidation. Now. Because this stuff would save his life. He opened the cardboard box in the back and pulled out a leather holster with his service revolver and an extra mag. Behind it was a consumer-grade assault rifle with two extra mags, and he slung it over his shoulder. He sheathed his hunting knife and snatched up a small LED flashlight, stuffing it into his pocket, just in case. Lastly was his combat boots. He reached out slowly, hand shaking, gripping the boots between his fingers to lift them out. The toe still had a dark splotch of something. Blood. That's still blood on there. But he shook his head as if he could shake the memories right out of it. He laced up his boots and stood up, puffing out his chest to try to feel strong. He was out of shape. It had been a long time since he'd served. And with his PTSD, he hadn't kept up any kind of vigorous activity. No time like the present, he muttered. Let's go do some cardio, Lennox. He dug around in his front hall drawer until he found an old map of the area and spread it out on the small table. The streets were packed full of zombies given all of the noise, but he had fourteen blocks to get through before he could reach the troops. If the park is blown out, it's probably safest to try to go through there, he mused, tapping his finger on Volunteer Park. He leaned over and peeked through two of the boards he'd nailed over the window next to the front door. There was a big enough slit that he could get a lay of the land, and his stomach knotted with dread and the sheer amount of ghouls heading up the street. He was going to have to get creative. He moved to the back of the house and peered out into the backyard. Luckily, there was nothing inside of his chest-high fence, which had thankfully held despite the hordes wandering around. Lennox closed his eyes for a moment, taking a deep, steadying breath, 
and then cracked open the back door. He clenched his jaw at the cracking of gunfire in the distance. It was louder out here, and he reminded himself that it would just get louder and louder the closer he got. He slipped outside, closing the door quietly behind him, creeping across the grass as stealthily as he could. His heart pounded in his chest, and he took a deep breath before peeking through the slats of the privacy fence. You got a long way to go, Lennox, he thought to himself. This isn't the time to get all freaked out. You got this. The groups of ghouls on the street here weren't as thick, spread out in packs of three or four. He waited for a considerable gap and then wrapped his fingers around the top of the fence. He grunted as he pulled himself up and over, landing on the other side with a louder thud than he'd anticipated. Two nearby zombies turned to him, mouths open, but he simply ran past them. He was out of shape and not the fastest, but he was still faster than shambling corpses. He made it to a front yard across the street, and then crouched behind a line of bushes, staying low as he continued to move up. The next few yards were clear, but up ahead he spotted two ghouls hanging out in a front flower garden, mystified by the knee-high fence surrounding them. How'd you even get in there? he wondered, as he crept forward, drawing his knife. He knew that he had to save his guns for when he really needed them, considering he didn't want to draw any attention to himself. He stayed low, pressing himself against the back of a white picket fence as he moved towards his target. He pushed his way between two bushes, and then leapt out, burying his knife into the back of one zombie's head. He wrenched it free and whipped to the side, stabbing the second one in the temple, and then ducked back into the bushes, waiting to see if he'd attracted any attention. He didn't hear any excited moans or feet shuffling closer, and chanced peeking out at the street. He nodded to himself in triumph, and surveyed the yards ahead. They were all very open, and with the zombies in the street getting thicker, he wasn't sure he wanted to chance jumping from tree trunk to tree trunk, without anywhere to retreat to. He peered through the gap between houses and realized the backyards didn't have privacy fences. He'd been reluctant to do all the backyards on his side, because he didn't think he'd make it hopping every fence without being too winded to complete his mission. He moved down the gap and pressed himself against the back corner, peering out. The backyards were all linked in a big, long row, with no fences backing into thick brush. It would be a gamble as to whether or not there were monsters in the trees, but it was a better gamble than the ones he knew were on the street. Lennox took off like a shot. He stayed closer to the houses, keeping his eyes forward and every so often glancing over at the brush to make sure nothing was hurtling out at him. He had the fleeting thought that the more the military fought, the higher likelihood there would be of fresh zombies that would be fast, faster than him. He shook it off. He couldn't worry about that right now. The troops would have tons more fast zombies if they got overrun by the ones breaking out of the convention center. At the end of the row, he skidded to a stop, panting, pressing himself against the brick wall of the house. The zombie river continued on the main road, and he took a deep breath and sprinted across to the backyard ahead. He darted through a kid's sandbox and then nearly bowled back over into it as a pack of zombies poured out from between the houses. He knew he wouldn't be able to take them all. He backtracked, running along the side wall to the front yard. There was a dented van with flat tires in the driveway, and he ran behind it, catching his breath and hoping he wouldn't catch the attention of the street zombies. The yards ahead were fairly open, and he cursed under his breath. He looked around frantically for something he could use as a distraction, and noticed the open garage door nearby. Inside was a lawnmower, one of the self-propelling ones. He chewed his lip. He could probably avoid notice getting in there to fire it up. But if it didn't work as he wanted it to, he'd be making a whole lot of noise that would give away his position without then diverting attention. Think quick, think quick, he urged himself, weighing his options. As one of the backyard zombies stumbled into view, he realized he had to risk it. Lennox tore for the garage and quickly grabbed the ripcord for the lawnmower, giving it a quick jerk. The engine sputtered, but didn't come to life. Fuck! Come on! He grunted, 
urging it to work. He pulled again, and nothing. Zombies in the street turned towards him excitedly. Fuck, fuck, come on, he yelled, all semblance of stealth gone out the window. He pulled again, and this time the lawnmower roared to life. He quickly pulled the lever and gave the mower a mighty push, sending it screaming down the driveway. It clipped a few zombies on the way by, and they turned in confusion towards the machine. It hit the mainstream, and then let out a loud whine as it couldn't go any further. Lennox took his opportunity as the ghouls turned towards it, reaching down and loosing fingers to the spinning blades as the lawnmower fell over onto its side. He knew it wouldn't last forever, so he took off like a shot, staying as close to the houses as he could, while the zombies concentrated on the crackling lawnmower. The ghouls farther up seemed confused, unsure of whether to go towards the gunfire, the lawnmower, or pay attention to the blur running to their right. Lennox didn't pay attention to them. He had his eye on the prize, needing to take this a block at a time. He managed to clear the second block, the wind whipping through his hair and heart pounding in his ears. Eight more to go. Chapter 4 Four blocks from the park, Lennox ducked into a child's wooden playhouse in a backyard. He needed to take a breather and the zombies were thick everywhere. The yard was surrounded by a waist-high chain-link fence, and before long ghouls pressed up against it. "'How the hell do you know that I'm in here?' he grunted. He didn't want to get caught stuck in this little playhouse. It was nice for a playhouse, but there were lots of open windows, and he'd be zombie chow for sure if he got surrounded. He groaned as he crawled out of the little house, swallowing hard at the sight of ghouls all along the fences. Shit, he thought. Shouldn't have stopped. He jogged across the yard, stepping up onto the back porch and peering into the sliding door. There was no movement inside, so he tried opening it. But it was locked. A oh, fucking course, he muttered, and looked around. The patio set, though overturned and splattered with blood, looked relatively sturdy, with thick metal chair legs. He picked one up and gave it a mighty swing, cracking the glass of the sliding door. There was a sickening creak behind him, and he glanced over his shoulder to see the fence buckling beneath the weight of the hungry ghouls. He took another swing, and this time the glass gave way. He shoved the chair forward, knocking out any little pieces that could cut him on the way in. He jumped through the frame and grabbed a hold of the massive refrigerator beside him, dragging it over and shoving it into place to block the door. He peered around it, seeing ghouls tripping over the chain link, pouring in from the neighboring area. Need to scope out the front, he thought. Need a plan of escape. This thing won't hold for long. He turned around and then immediately threw his hands out as a zombie snapped at his face. Lennox screamed something unintelligible. Shock turning his brain to mush as he struggled to keep the monster's teeth away from his tender flesh. He needed a weapon, to grab for something on his person, but if he let go with one arm, he was worried he wouldn't be able to hold the corpse back. How are these things so damn strong? He huffed and pushed as hard as he could. He was able to shove the ghoul back into the stove and wrestled with it, trying to bend it back far enough so he could lock his arm and grab for his knife. There was a thump at the sliding door, and he looked frantically over his shoulder, seeing a cluster of zombies smacking into the glass. The fridge shuddered, and his vigor renewed, a burst of strength pouring through his arm as he bent the zombie back under the fume hood. He pulled his knife and plunged it into the ghoul's face, tearing it free and then darting through the kitchen towards the front of the house. A zombie staggered out of a door to the left, and he instinctively kicked at it knocking it back with a firm boot to the chest. He quickly glanced into the living room to make sure nothing else was going to come out at him, and then dove onto the fallen ghoul, stabbing it in the forehead. Lennox scrambled to his feet as the fridge began to squeak against the linoleum and tore for the front door. He peered out the front window, seeing clusters of zombies milling about. None of them were paying attention to the house, but there were enough close to the door that he wouldn't have an easy time running through them. He muttered obscenities under his breath and whirled around at the sound of a muffled 
Bang! Down the hallway, arms began to flail around the side of the fridge. He knew he didn't have much time. He looked up the stairs. If the banging was coming from there, that meant more ghouls upstairs. But if they were banging around, there was a good chance they were locked in a room. He glanced back at the front door. A zombie shambled close to it, and he shook his head. He knew it would be suicide to go out that way, but he couldn't waffle for much longer, with the horde pushing through the makeshift barricade at the back. Lennox shook his head and ran up the stairs, taking them two at a time. He stopped on the landing, checking all the doors, and a bang came from the closest one on the left. He selected the bathroom, which was adjacent to the house next door, and slammed the door behind him, locking it for good measure. Okay, okay, what now? He hurried to the small frosted glass window and slid it open. It would be a tight squeeze, but he'd be able to make it through if he sucked in his gut. He punched out the screen and stuck his head out. There were a few zombies wandering around in the grass below, but he wasn't keen on dropping all the way to the ground. He looked left and right, noting that just to the right of him was a little outcropping of roof that overhung a small room on the side of the house. Across from that was a tree, with decently strong-looking branches, and then the roof of the bungalow next door. He wasn't too excited by the prospect of being treed by zombies or potentially being stuck on a roof surrounded by a sea of them. The bathroom door rattled on its hinges, wet smacks resonating, and he took a deep breath. There was no backtracking now. At least if I can get across without detection, maybe there's less on the other side of the bungalow, he thought, and took a deep breath. The banging on the door intensified, and he shook his head. He took his rifle from his shoulder and hung it out the window, giving it a light toss to the outcropping of roof. It hit on the butt and slid down the shingles. He watched in horror as it slipped off the edge, and then his breath resumed as the strap caught on the eaves trough. It swung dangerously by half of the strap, and he shook his head. At least he had his other weapons, but the rifle was a nice little extra feeling of security in the world of flesh-eating monsters. He put his hands on the window frame and wriggled his way through the opening. As expected, it was tight around his middle and he cursed his lack of activity since his military years. PTSD and cheesies were good for nobody. There was a moment of panic where he thought for sure he wouldn't make it through, and be forced to stay here, stuck as his legs got eaten on the other side. He couldn't even reach any of his weapons to shoot himself and spare the pain and agony. Fuck that, he grunted, and took a deep breath, flexing his abs as hard as he could and sucking in. Lennox finally managed to budge and struggle free of the window frame. He sat on it for a moment, legs hanging over the toilet, and tried to ignore the furious slamming on the bathroom door. The gap between the window and the roof wasn't small, and he needed to psych himself up. Remember that raid where you were stuck in that flaming house, and you had to jump across to a flimsy old truck? He pulled his knees in, carefully planting his feet on the windowsill, and hanging there in a crouch. That was a way bigger jump than this. You did that, and you got four greeny privates to do it. They'd make fun of you now, old man, waffling over this piddly-ass jump. He reached up and grabbed a hold of the top of the window frame, bending his knees and getting ready to spring. The bathroom door gave a sickening crunch as he leapt, kicking off as hard as he could. He curled his legs up, willing them to catch the shingles, willing his body to fly far enough. As soon as his boots hit the roof, he immediately scrambled for handholds, not wanting to succumb to the same fate as his rifle. When he managed to steady himself, he stayed stock still, a tableau of relief on his hands and feet on the roof like a cat. He took a few deep, shuddering breaths, and then there was a great crack from the bathroom, and moans echoed through the window. Before long, rotted arms reached through the hole, and he clenched his jaw marvelling at how quickly he could have become their snack. He leaned down and grabbed the strap of the rifle, somehow still hanging by the eaves trough, and pulled it up, slinging securely over his back once again. Lennox turned, careful to steady his boots on the declined surface, and eyed the tree. The branches suddenly didn't look so sturdy now that he was faced with jumping to them, but he had no choice now. 
He studied his points of entry, choosing a thick branch off shooting the trunk at an angle that was just right for a foothold. He rocked back and forth a few times, but before he could doubt himself, he took a step and launched himself off of the shingles and into the tree. Branches smacked him in the face, slowing his momentum, but his front foot managed to find its target. He slipped, arms flailing and grabbing whatever he could, and he managed to hang on. Feet pressed against the trunk as he gripped bowing branches in his fists. Hungry moans floated up to him, and though he knew it was a bad idea to look down, he did it anyway. He had quite the audience down there, and they were just waiting for him to fail so they could get their snack. Not today, fuckers, he grunted, and kicked up his leg until it was securely between the trunk and branch he'd originally been aiming for. He heaved himself up, swinging an arm to grab onto the trunk. He pulled, groaning loudly as he managed to get his body wedged between the two branches. What was that about a big jump? Lennox stared across at the bungalow roof and chewed his bottom lip for a moment. This was a significantly bigger gap, and he couldn't take a run at it. He looked around to see if there were any other sturdy branches he could use as a stepping stone. One jutted out from the trunk at an angle and he reached down to push on it, testing its strength. He planted one of his boots onto it, and gently swung over, putting his body weight on it. Okay, a little closer now, he thought, but he couldn't go any further out on that branch without it bowing too much, potentially breaking. He looked down at his audience again, and shook his head. So much for doing this stealthily. All he could do was hope to get across the bungalow fast enough to find a gap to jump down through. Is this trip over yet? he muttered, and then rocked back and forth a bit to wind up his leap. He finally pushed off, raising his feet again, and when the balls of his feet connected with the edge of the bungalow, he seemed to hang in the air for a moment, nearly bowling back over into the sea of death below. He windmilled his arms wildly, managing to tip the scales just enough to fall forward and dug his nails into one of the seams where the steel roof slats were bolted together. He hissed at the zing of pain in his fingers, and managed to dig his toes into the eaves trough to alleviate the pressure on his fingernails. He stayed like that for a moment, and then when he was sure he was secure, he reached over and grabbed one of the corner shingles, managing to get a good grip on the raised decorative pieces there. He made his way up to the top of the low roof, and then swung around so he could climb down on the front corner opposite to him. The road didn't look too packed, thankfully, and he hoped there was a good gap in the front yard. He made his way down to the edge as quickly as he could, before his audience found their way around the house, and leaned back as far as he could to take stock of the ground. Miraculously, there were no ghouls below him, and before he could overthink it, he lowered his feet off of the edge until he dangled from the eaves trough by his hands. The metal groaned, and he panicked, letting go before the trough could break free of the roof. A zing went up his legs as he landed, his body landing with a jolt. A few ghouls from the road turned in his direction, and he took off like a shot, tearing through front yards until he could barely breathe. Two blocks away from the park, Lennox was exhausted. He had a stitch in his side, his feet ached, and it felt as if every breath were laced with pins and needles. He knew he was going to have to cross the street over to the left side, but wasn't sure how he was going to get through the ghouls. They had gotten even thicker this close to the park, and he could smell the burnt, rotted flesh on the air. He took a breather behind a row of garbage cans and contemplated his next move. The front door of the house next to him hung open and he squinted to see if there was any movement inside. It didn't look like it, so he took off and barreled up the front steps. He shut the door behind him and did a quick sweep of the main floor, finding nothing. He rushed to the kitchen and flung open the fridge, scanning for something to drink. There was a can of beer in the door, and he grabbed it, popping it open. He knew it wouldn't hydrate him, really, but at least it would wet his mouth a bit. He took a few gulps and then set it down, grimacing at the taste of warm brew. He went back and peered out the front window and took a deep breath. How the fuck am I gonna get across? He muttered, scanning the area. He turned back to the kitchen and found the door leading out to the garage. He descended the few steps inside, 
looking around at the plethora of sports equipment and junk around. He spotted something shiny in the corner and pushed through some hockey nets to get to it. Leaned up against the wall was a curved chunk of fiberglass, looking like the detached hood of an old car. He lifted it, testing its weight, and then flipped it around, looking to see if there was anything to hold on to inside. There were little bars welded to the inside, and he wasn't sure what they were for, but he wasn't about to look a gift horse in the mouth. He moved over to the garage door and peered outside. This is crazy and stupid, he muttered to himself. It needs to work, but there's not a good chance that it will. He cocked his head. But what choice do you have? And how much are you going to argue with yourself out loud before you just go crazy? He took a deep breath and wrapped his hand around the door handle, giving it a twist to release it. Here we go. He threw open the door and took off at a run, gripping the bars with white knuckles. The noise of the door opening attracted the attention of the ghouls in the immediate vicinity, and they turned towards him on the street. Lennox let out a yell and smashed into the sea of zombies, smashing the hood into the lineup like a battering ram. He managed to keep up his momentum fairly well despite being so out of shape, knocking ghouls back with the curved fiberglass. Halfway through, he was concerned about the ones he left in his wake, but didn't want to waste any time looking behind him. The only way was forward now. When he broke through the other side, he threw the hood aside, and it hit the sidewalk with a loud clang. His shirt suddenly tightened around his throat, and he whipped sideways as a corpse managed to grab a fistful of his sleeve. He jerked on it, but only succeeded in dragging his captor along into the grass. He fumbled with his knife, stabbing wildly, and managed to get it through the skull and wrench his arm free of the death grip. He could smell the rotted breath of his enemies. They were too close. He ran. He didn't even know if it was the right direction in his panic, but the gunfire was closer and he thought he was running towards it. Gun smoke and ash, and blood and screams. Stop it! He wrenched himself free of his memories, coming back to the present. Lives are at stake, Lennox. Keep your shit together. The park was only a block away the scent of burnt, rotten flesh wafting into his nose, and he almost welcomed it. It kept him grounded, kept him present, chased away his old demons despite bringing new ones. He came upon a waist-high chain-link fence and threw himself over it, finally chancing a glance behind him. Some zombies from the road approached, but not enough to be worried about the fence, so he slowed his pace a bit through the row of backyards to try to chill his racing heart. The last yard separated him from the park by another, waist-high fence, but he barely noticed it as he took in the carnage. What had once been a beautifully landscaped park was now a charred wasteland, complete with flaming zombies waiting to barbecue their fresh meal. Chapter 5 Fuck me, Lennox breathed, and then shook his head. He had to get across the park to the north, and he was going to have to fight his way through. The smouldering ghouls still wandering around were spaced out and slow, some of them falling here and there when their limbs succumbed to fire damage. He clutched his knife and drew his sidearm. There was no point attempting to be stealthy here. The gunfire was loud enough and the zone hot enough that extra gunshots wouldn't do much for his position. He hopped the fence and moved at a quick walk deliberate and strategic. He hopped over an unmoving black mass and slashed with his knife, severing a smouldering zombie's head like butter. A trio still on fire staggered towards him, and he popped off two quick shots to dispatch the closest ones, lunging forward to stab the third in the forehead. Despite not being in combat for years, the training washed over him, taking control of his limbs, muscle memory taking the wheel as he moved through the park. He kicked a crispy corpse in the chest and leapt over another, stabbing another and dropping his shoulder to barrel through two barely standing ghouls like a linebacker. He came out the other side of the park with a half a mag left in his gun, covered in soot and dust. He tore across the street, darting up a back alley behind some buildings towards the interstate. He let the adrenaline drive him, taking in deep lungfuls of air fresher than that of the burned-up park. A zombie staggered out from behind a dumpster and he stabbed it up through the chin, piercing its brain and shoving it aside. 
The gunfire was so loud, so close, but he fought away the panic rising in his chest, desperately grasping onto his training. The adrenaline. The mission. This was his mission. When he was in sight of the bridge, his jaw dropped. The military wasn't doing as well as he'd hoped. Troops fought a wave of zombies, and though many of them were firing from atop cars, enough were battling hand to hand that it was clear they definitely didn't have enough ammunition to go around. What the fuck are you doing marching in here unprepared? He thought, shaking his head. They were even more unprepared than they knew, and he had to tell them. He wasn't sure how he was going to get over there, though. He had to get their attention somehow. There were too many ghouls between them. He jogged across a parking lot, trying to get a better vantage point, and saw that they'd set up a barricade of cars on the bridge, so that soldiers could fall back to safety and swap out with other troops. At least they had some kind of safe zone. The telltale sound of helicopter blades cut the air, and his eyes widened as an Apache came into view. He opened his mouth to scream, scream at them to stop, but it was no use. Nobody knew he was there. He hit the ground, covering his head, as the chopper dropped another firebomb on the zombies, sending another shockwave through the area. The sound of shattering glass made Lennox's stomach sink into his toes. He staggered to his feet as the helicopter swooped away, his body suddenly so tired, so exhausted, so done with this day. No, the mission. He studied the area. The bomb had gotten rid of quite a few zombies, but there were enough that he wouldn't be able to fight his way through to the barricade. He positioned himself at the edge of the parking lot, climbing up onto one of the cement dividers and waving his arms. Hey! he screamed. Hey! Over here! Nobody looked his way. The gunfire was too strong, the zombies too thick, the night too dark despite the solar-powered streetlights. Fuck! he muttered and looked around frantically. Swaths of ghouls staggered into the parking lot behind him, and his heart rate picked up for what felt like the hundredth time that day. He clenched his jaw and pulled his rifle from his back, aiming at one of the cars near the barricade. He pulled the trigger, firing a few bullets into the door, and a few of the nearby soldiers froze, turning towards him. He pulled out his flashlight and flashed it a few times, hoping like hell they would get the hint. One of the soldiers gestured wildly, and a team of five began to battle in his direction, systematically taking out ghouls. Lennox jumped down from the cement pillar, rushing forward and taking out a few zombies from behind, lightening the load as the soldiers made their way to him. You bit! One of the soldiers barked as they approached, and Lennox raised his arms. No, I need to talk to your higher-ups now, he declared. The soldier looked hesitant, but one of his teammates lunged past him to kick an approaching ghoul in the chest. Come on, he snapped. We don't have time for this. Lennox scurried up to them, joining the team. He used his sidearm to help clear the way, and soon they were back at the barricade. He immediately clambered up on top, eyes wild, waving his gun around. Y'all are walking into a trap, he yelled, and then realized too late how much of a lunatic he must have looked like. As he stared down no less than eight gun barrels, he lowered his arms and holstered his sidearm. Sorry, it's been a rough day. A sergeant approached, standing in between two of the aiming troops. Who are you? he asked, cocking a brow. Former Private Lennox Stadler, sir, he replied, putting out his hands. I'm going to come down now. When his boots hit the asphalt, he tugged at his dog tags, pulling them out of his shirt. Sergeant Miller the man in charge said, and motioned for his men to stand ground. What's this about a trap? Lennox took a deep breath. This was his mission. It was almost over. He'd done it. Jax had believed in him, and he'd made it here. The high-rise over there, it's on top of a convention center, he explained, turning to motion towards Jax's place. There are a thousand of those things trapped inside, but they aren't going to be for much longer with these bombs weakening the windows. Miller immediately snatched a radio from his belt. Captain Parker, do you copy? After a moment, a voice came back. Copy. Watch your status, Sergeant. Miller raised his chin, staring at the high-rise. There is a convention center just off the interstate. We've just learned it's full of a thousand of those things, he replied. 
Windows are weak from the blasts, and if they get out, we'll be overrun. We're already fighting by the skin of our teeth out here. We'd be fucked with another wave of a thousand. One moment, Sergeant, Parker replied, and the line went silent for a while. The hair on the back of Lennox's neck stood on end. He didn't have a good feeling about the look on the soldier's face. It was possible that he hadn't helped Jax after all, and dread began to build in his gut. Stand by, Sergeant, Parker came back. We'll send back the Apache and destroy the building. Lennox snarled. No fucking way, he cried. My friends are in there. Miller fixed him with a steel glare. We can't sacrifice our entire mission and put all of the troops at risk for a few people, he said firmly. Fuck that, Lennox snapped. You can't just write them off. We need to get them out of there. The sergeant stared down his nose at the fuming civilian. Collateral damage is a byproduct of war, he said, waving him off. An ex-soldier should know that. Those people are the reason that you have this information in the first place. Lennox shot back, pointing a finger at the condos. They sent me out here to warn you because they wanted to save your lives. Without them, you would all be fucking dead. You owe them. Miller clenched his jaw, clearly unimpressed with the tone. But his eyes betrayed his uncertainty on the matter. He turned away from Lennox and pulled out his radio again. Captain Parker, do you copy? he asked, voice a little annoyed. What is it, Sergeant? Parker replied immediately, voice equal in tone and measure. Miller took a deep breath. There are civilians in the high-rise, he explained. How many? the captain asked. Miller glanced at Lennox, who gritted his teeth. Three, he ground out, clenching his fists. The sergeant sighed. Three, sir, he replied. But— we can't risk the mission for three civilians, Parker cut in. Frankly, I'm appalled you even called back to tell me. Miller held up a hand as Lennox growled his displeasure. Sir, the civilians are the ones that got us this message, he explained. Is there any way we can mount a rescue before we blow the building? There was a moment of silence, and finally the captain sighed. I take it they can't get out close to ground level, he asked. Lennox shook his head. Everything below the twelfth floor is overrun, he said. That would be a negative, Captain, the sergeant relayed through the radio. There will be a chopper on the roof to pick them up in one hour, Parker replied. If they're not there, they're SOL. Miller nodded. Thank you, Captain. I'll relay the message. Thank you, Lennox said, pressing his palms together. Thank you. Chapter 6 Jax, come in, Lennox's voice came through the radio, and Jax jerked in his chair, fumbling with the receiver. Jax! Skylar and Marcus practically dove off of the couch they'd been curled up on, scrambling over to the radio desk. Lennox, did you reach them? Jax asked, white-knuckling the radio while he waited for a response. I did, came the reply. I'm standing here with the sergeant right now, and he says thanks for the intel. Jax punched the air with his fist, narrowly missing Marcus's face as he leaned over his shoulder. "'That's great news!' he exclaimed, unaware of his near punch. "'So what are they going to do?' "'Well,' Lennox drew out the word, and then took a deep breath. "'They're going to bomb the building. You guys need to get to the roof within the hour for pickup.' Skylar paled. "'Wait, what?' Jax shook his head vigorously. "'The roof?' He scratched the back of his head. Okay, okay. Thank you. We're going to get on that, buddy. See you soon, buddy, Lennox said. Jax set down the receiver and maneuvered himself around to look at his shell-shocked companions. Looks like we're getting out of here, finally. The roof, though, Skylar said. I guess it makes sense that there's no other way. How the hell else would they be picking us up? Marcus chewed his lip for a moment. Where's the roof access? Jack shook his head. There's no direct roof access. The top level of the penthouse has a terrace, he explained. That's where we have to get to. But the penthouse is overrun, Marcus argued. Jax nodded. It is, he replied, though they all knew that. What a shitty time for that rich asshole to have a company party, Skylar muttered, crossing her arms. 
If he'd have waited a damn week, then the upper floors wouldn't be full of those things. Jack shook his head. Too late to commiserate on that now, he said. Where is the barricade? The stairs before the penthouse, Marcus replied. The door was open, probably somebody trying to escape when the party guests started eating each other. So the top floors are full of those things. Jax nodded. So we need to fight our way up to the penthouse, he said slowly, counting off on his fingers as he spoke. Fight across it to the stairs. Get up to the top floor balcony. Then get to the stairs at the back of the roof terrace. He swallowed hard. You two need to... No, no, Skylar cut in, waving her hands back and forth in front of her face. We're not leaving you here. He cocked his head, eyes as firm as they could be. I appreciate the sentiment, he replied, but I can't walk. This isn't just a prop, you know. We'll carry you, Marcus replied quickly. We'll carry you up the flight of stairs. Jack shook his head, spreading his arms. While fighting zombies, he scoffed or trying to be fast to outrun them. You can't do that while hauling a wheelchair around, not to mention how narrow the staircase is up to the penthouse door. We're not leaving you here, Skylar snapped, so we're going to figure it the fuck out. What have you got for weapons? Marcus asked. We don't have anything at our place other than kitchen knives. Jax pursed his lips for a moment. I have a six-shot revolver, he admitted, in my bedroom closet. I've never fired it before, though. He looked between the two. Either of you know your way around a gun? The couple shook their heads. My girl could outrun a bullet, but we've never fired one, Marcus said. Jack shrugged. I guess it's pretty straightforward, he replied. I'll go get it for you guys. Probably good to have, just in case. Not for us guys, Skylar argued. You're coming with us. You get the gun, I'll find some other hand-to-hand -hand weapons, and babe... You figure out how we're taking Jax with us. She pointed to each of them in turn, and then stalked off to the kitchen in a huff. Marcus shook his head. You'd better listen to her, man, he said with a smirk. Sky always gets what she wants. Jack swallowed hard and smiled sadly. I'll keep that in mind. He wheeled his way off to the bedroom, past his bed, to the closet. He opened it up and rummaged around the shelf until he found the old shoebox with his gun. There you are, old friend, he thought as he pulled it down and set it on his lap. He didn't open it right away. This box held so many memories for him, and none were pleasant. The gun had been his father's, and his father's before him. He didn't even know why he'd accepted it from his mum when his father died. There was no love lost between Jax and his old man. It apparently had been too much for him to have a son that was half a man, as he loved to put it. At least his mother had never made him feel like less of a person with his disability. But even at a young age, he'd been able to see it was hard on her, essentially raising a disabled son by herself because her husband was too thick-headed to be there for his family. Jack sighed as he lifted the lid. The piece was old, but it was in immaculate condition. His father had kept it in perfect working order. He loved his guns, that man. Jax wondered if his father had ever put it to his own head, weighing the value of his life. The wheelchair-bound man knew what that felt like. When his father had drank himself into an early grave, he'd blamed himself. Blamed his mother's depression on himself. Blamed so much on himself and his useless legs. He remembered the feel of the cold steel, unforgiving against the warm flesh. He hadn't even had the courage to pull the hammer back. The saving thought had been picturing his mother's face, finding him dead of a gunshot wound to the skull. That, and the fear. He hadn't really wanted to die, but it was a low moment. He caressed the gun, debating whether to pick it up or not. They won't make it very far with me. They won't make it out at all, he thought. I might be able to convince Marcus to leave me, but not Skylar. And there's not enough time to argue. They need to get to the roof, get up there and escape. He clenched his jaw. What life is there for a cripple in the apocalypse? He let out a dark laugh under his breath. It's not like the zombies will give me handicap parking. Hey, buddy, I figured it out. I... Marcus stopped short in the doorway, staring at his friend's guilty expression. 
hand resting on the gun in the box. Jax blushed crimson, jerking his hand from the box like it was on fire. Marcus took a deep, shuddering breath and rushed over to him. He snatched the box from his friend's lap, putting the lid back on it, and then held up his other hand, a series of fabric strips in his hand. We figured out what we're going to do, he said hoarsely, and then stared down his nose at the wheelchair-bound man. And I'm not going to tell Skylar what you are about to do. Jax opened his mouth to deny it, but snapped it shut again. He knew it was no use to try. He simply nodded. Thank you, he said quietly, and then straightened his shoulders. What, what are we doing with these? He reached out to touch one of the strips, realizing they were thick chunks of his living room curtain. Marcus turned and waved for him to follow. We're going to make you into a backpack, he declared. A backpack? Jax blurted, rolling his way out of the bedroom in disbelief. Skylar emerged from the kitchen with a few butcher knives and a tenderizing mallet. Well, we can make a schnitzel out of these things, at least, she announced, dropping the weapons on the coffee table with a clatter. What have you got? You remember those baby slings your sister used to make and sell on the internet? Marcus asked, holding up one of the strips. Her eyes widened. Oh, the wrap carriers, she exclaimed. Good thinking. I'm sorry, Jax cut in, raising his hand. Baby slings? Skylar nodded like a bobblehead. Yeah, but you could use them for bigger kids too, she explained as she took the fabric from her boyfriend. It's all about proper weight distribution. It'll help hold your legs up so you can piggyback on Marcus's back. Well, Jack stammered, shaking his head. I'm not light. I'll weigh you down too much. Marcus rolled his eyes. I know I don't look like much, dude, but I can carry you up a few flights of stairs on my back, he said. Skylar will have to do the bulk of the fighting, but we got this. You bet your ass we do, she added, and motioned to the floor in front of the wheelchair. Kneel down, babe. It'll be easier to do this if you're closer to the floor. Her boyfriend smirked at her, a wicked glint in his eye as he got down on the carpet, back facing Jack's. Don't even, you dirtball, she scolded, swatting his shoulder as she reached out her hand to Jack's. Okay, so you wrap your arms around Marcus's shoulders, and I'll get you wrapped up like a snuggly bundle of joy. He couldn't help but laugh at that, and reached forward, but paused. Wait he said. How low is my ass going to be hanging here? I don't know if I'll be able to reach back far enough to kill anything that comes to take a bite. Hmm, Skylar mused, tapping her chin, and then raised a hand. Hang on, she said, and dropped the fabric. Running back to the kitchen, she emerged with a roll of duct tape in her hand, and rushed off to the bedroom, coming back with the two dumbfounded men with a comforter from the bed. What the? Jax wondered, blinking at her. We're going to make you into a burrito, she declared. You'll be warm, but your ass will be safe. Marcus laughed and shook his head, clapping Jax on the shoulder. True MacGyver treatment today, my friend. Chapter 7 How are you feeling? Skylar asked as they entered the hallway, glancing back at Jax. He held up his meat tenderizer, giving her a little salute with it. Swaddled, he replied. My back is sweating already, Marcus added. I can't imagine how warm you are in there. They wrapped Jax in the comforter up to his armpits and duct taped it securely around him. Skylar had cut a slit up between his legs and they taped the armor around his thighs so that everything hanging off of Marcus's back would be sufficiently padded. He patted his marshmallow leg with the revolver which they'd decided he would hang on to given his lack of mobility. Toasty, he admitted, but if it keeps me from being zombie food, I don't care if I'm running a fever after this. Skylar smiled at him and adjusted her grip on the butcher knife she'd selected. Good, she said. She was pretty proud of her handiwork with the fabric, having created a makeshift seat around Marcus's torso, held up by crisscrossing straps up and over his shoulders. She wouldn't be winning any safety awards any time soon, but if they were able to pull this off and get Jax to safety on the roof, unscathed, then she counted it as a win. Marcus raised his two knives, having decided to don two since he had limited mobility. Skylar would be the one opening doors and such, so she needed a free hand. 
Let's do this, he said, and she nodded, taking a deep breath. This was it. They had to make it through two floors of flesh-eating monsters in less than an hour in hopes of meeting a helicopter to get them out of here before the military bombed them. Yeah, just another day in the apocalypse, she thought to herself, forcing the panic back down her throat. We got this, she urged herself, and led them down the hallway. She opened the stairwell door as quietly as she could, and they slipped inside. The emergency light still worked, albeit dimly, so they had a view of the silhouette of the barricade she and Marcus had built just before the landing on the penthouse floor. She paused at the door to the fourteenth floor, chewing her lip for a moment. Time. Time was something they didn't have much of, but there was something she couldn't leave without. I just need to grab one thing, she whispered, and opened the door to their floor, ushering Marcus to follow her. As she quietly closed the door behind her, he furrowed his brow. Babe, what are you doing? he asked. There's nothing in there that can help us. She pressed her palms together, eyes begging. I'm sorry, I'll be quick, she said, and ran down the hallway to their condo. She slipped inside and went straight for the office, kneeling down in front of the bookshelf. On the bottom, next to a set of vintage Tolkien's, was a little wooden box. She flipped the latch and opened it, wrapping her hand around the silver coin inside. It wasn't an actual coin, or at least not one used for currency. She ran a finger over the etched mountain drawing on the front and then flipped it over. Skylar, my heart, my life, my world. She clutched it in her palm, tears pricking the corner of her eyes. Her father had given her this when she was fourteen, when he was diagnosed with cancer. She'd been sure he would pull through, but he knew better, and as an adult she understood how naive she'd been. It was never easy to lose a parent, especially so young, and he'd gifted her the engraved coin as a reminder of his affection, even after he was gone. She'd carried it during every marathon. It was her lucky charm. She kissed it and then stuffed it into her pocket, heading for the door. Need your luck today, Daddy, she whispered and then slipped back out into the hallway. "'Find what you need?' Jax asked, his voice a little on edge. Marcus looked down at her pocket, seeing the outline of the coin, and offered her a sad smile, reaching out to give her shoulder a reassuring squeeze. Skylar smiled back and then squared her shoulders. "'I'm ready,' she replied. "'Let's go.' She led them back to the stairwell, and they moved back in as soundlessly as they moved out. She took a deep breath as they crept up to the penthouse barricade. The shuffling feet and moaning from above was enough to make Skylar's blood run cold, but she steeled her resolve and slid her knife into her belt, making sure it was secure. The last thing she needed was to drop her only weapon. She grabbed onto a fancy-looking ornate chair, giving it a little wiggle to make sure if she removed it that the whole pile wouldn't fall down on them. When nothing else shifted— She tugged it free and set it aside. She moved up and did the same with a nightstand, pulling it down and passing it off to Marcus, who set it down a little harder than he'd meant to on the landing. The resounding smack gave the zombies above something to get excited about, and moans erupted. They echoed down and down the stairwell, and soon hungry moans from below the bottom barricade responded, brethren calling back that they wanted a snack too. Skylar swallowed hard and tugged on a coffee table they'd stood up on its end as a makeshift wall. A snarl sounded on the other side of it, and as they pulled it down, a ghoul on the other side reached over a TV stand, clawed fingers snatching at her. She pulled her knife while propping the table against one shoulder, using it as a shield as she stabbed forward. She managed to catch the zombie in the eye socket and wrenched the blade free. She was glad she aimed for soft tissue as the blade scraped against the skull on the way out. She wasn't sure the kitchen knives would cut through bone, and she didn't need to be missing at a crucial moment or having her blade glance off of her head. Skylar aimed again, stabbing another in the face, this time into the soft, rotted flesh of the ghoul's nose. As it slumped down, the ones behind it got even more excited and pressed against the barricade. Sky, Marcus hissed stepping up behind her. She shook her head. I don't think we can pull this down without getting overrun, she replied. We'll have to climb over. She pursed her lips, thinking of how he was going to be able to do that with his jacks pack. 
Or I'll need to climb over, and then once it's clear, we can dismantle the barricade. Here, he insisted, holding out his second knife. I'll take your spot and try to get at them from here. Distract them while you get up top. She nodded, glad that he hadn't taken the time to argue with her. That's why I love you, babe, she thought as she found a foothold on the thick bookshelf. You don't waste time trying to talk me out of shit when I know what I'm doing. Time. Time is what they needed to make the most of, and the danger of their situation didn't really matter, considering if they didn't make it to the roof, they'd get blown up anyway. She balanced on her knees at the top of the pile, and Marcus did what he said he would, waving his knife wildly at the ghouls. Yeah, come get some bitches, he snarled, and Skylar stifled a laugh. Her sweet Marcus using the word bitches? This truly was the end of days. She inched her way over as the bulk of the group clustered around her boyfriend. She had hoped that she could just stab down from the top, but she wouldn't be able to reach. Here we go, she thought. Don't freak out, babe. She studied the five ghouls and their positioning, and then took a deep breath and jumped down to the floor. Despite Marcus's cry of protest, he managed to stab a zombie in the face, cutting the count to four. What are you doing? he bellowed but she didn't answer because she didn't want the group to realize there was a fresh meal behind them. Skylar grabbed a fistful of one's hair, jerking it back and reaching around to drive her blade into its temple. She dropped the body immediately as another turned towards her, snarling, and she lashed out without missing a beat, stabbing it in the eye. Hey, right here, Jax cried, Marcus's voice yelling something unintelligible. Both men flailed but couldn't reach either of the two remaining ghouls as they turned to Skylar. She eyed the railing of the top floor landing and made the quick decision to barrel forward. She darted to the right and slammed her shoulder into one of the zombies, driving it back, but not far enough. She threw herself forward, shoving with her fists into its chest, but her momentum halted as the other one grabbed a fistful of her hair in a death grip. Her knives went clattering to the ground in her shock. No, 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 she thought frantically, but she couldn't give up. If these things killed her, then Marcus would be faced with a fresh, fast zombie, and it would be significantly harder for them to get out. If she was just bitten, then at least she could still get them to the roof. She lurched to the side in an attempt to deflect a bite, figuring at least if it was on her arm instead of her throat, it wouldn't be imminently fatal. She pushed hard against the ghoul at the railing, keeping its snapping jaws away from her face. No bite came. She managed to glance back and saw that Marcus had a hold of the zombie's shirt. He couldn't reach it with the knife, but at least he was holding it at bay. With renewed vigor, Skylar shoved forward again, her scalp screaming from the pull. This time she managed to tip the ghoul over the railing, and it hit the stairs below with a wet crack. She reached up to grip the wrist of the zombie still twisted in her hair, trying to wrench it free. Just as she turned, she caught a glimmer of steel, and a deafening boom resounded in the stairwell. Her ears rang, and she finally wrenched the rotted fingers from her hair as the corpse fell. Get this shit out of the way, Marcus grunted, pulling at the debris from the barricade. Jack stayed stock still on his back, staring at the smoking gun in his hand in shock. Hang on, babe, hang on. Skylar muttered as she pulled some of the furniture aside, shoving it into the corner and out of the way. As soon as Marcus was clear, he was on her, holding her tightly as if he'd never let her go. What the hell was that, huh? He asked thickly. You could have died. Jesus. He buried his face into her hair. I'm sorry, Skylar murmured against Jax's arm, awkwardly caught in their embrace. But it's okay. I'm okay. We've got to move. They parted, and she looked up at the gun-toting man. Thank you. She blinked back tears, not wanting to think about how this all could have ended so fast. Of course, Jax replied hoarsely, and cleared his throat. She knelt and picked up her knives, giving one back to Marcus. If there was time to switch, he said, shaking his head, I'd be switching you, you little hellcat. Skylar smirked, trying to bring some levity to the situation. Don't pretend like it doesn't get you all hot watching me kick ass, she teased with a wink. Marcus blew out an exasperated laugh and shook his head. He motioned to the penthouse door. Let's do this, ass kicker. Chapter 
Chapter 8 Miller barked out orders, sending soldiers to and fro on the lines to continue to take out zombies. They were almost finished with the current wave. Lennox stood between two privates, aiming down range and taking down ghouls with utmost precision. He'd felt like lending his bullets to the cause was a must, especially considering this was their only hope of rescue. Jax had told him about the ships that came in on the lake, although Lennox had heard them, he hadn't known where the gunfire was coming from. Hope had been tentative that the military would be coming to save them, but of course the military's focus wasn't to save a quartet of civilians. Their higher-ups just wanted to clear the city. Lennox tried not to be bitter about it. He knew how it was. The sergeant took his orders from his captain, who took his orders from his general and so on, all the way up to the President, if that's who was pulling the strings here. A full-on zombie apocalypse was a special situation, and it looked like they were clearing the city to hopefully build a safe place for humanity to survive. Of course, that mission was damn important, and the soldier needed to press on, do everything they could, otherwise it would fail. But on the other hand, if there were no civilians left to fill the damned safe place, then what the hell was the point of all this? One big, giant military circle jerk? Lennox shook his head, taking aim at another ghoul and dropping it. There's got to be other survivors out there, he thought. Other communities, even. People to bring back here once it's done. In any case, this particular sergeant was the one who'd agreed to help his friends. So he was grateful for that. Grateful that I'm persistent and mouthy, he thought to himself. Good job, boys, Miller barked as the last of the wave of zombies fell to the asphalt. Orders are to sit tight for a few until we can get that building down. Take a break. Grab a bite. You boys on the barricade, keep watch for any activity. Yes, sir, one of the corporals said with a firm nod. Lennox, you're to head to the back to wait for your friends, the sergeant continued, pointing at him. I appreciate the help. You're a hell of a shot. Lennox nodded. He didn't want to acknowledge the praise. In truth, he knew he was good at shooting and killing. It was something that he'd spent years warring with inside of himself. He didn't want to be good at taking life. At least with zombies, their lives were already claimed. It was a mercy, putting them down. That's how he had to frame it in his head to keep the demons at bay. How much longer do they have? He asked as he walked alongside the sergeant. Just under a half hour, Miller replied. Lennox shook his head. He hoped to hell that they didn't run into too much trouble. Jax hadn't seemed thrilled about needing to get to the roof, and he wasn't sure if it was because there were zombies in the way, or just the fact that he was in a wheelchair. Maybe both. Do you know what the state of that building is up top? The sergeant asked. Lennox shook his head. No, he replied. I know Jax is on the twelfth floor, not sure about the other two. I think a few up from him, but I have no idea what the penthouse looks like. Hopefully nothing too bad. I know they had to barricade everything from Jax's floor down. Shouldn't be too bad to get up there, then, Miller replied. Yeah, stairs are real easy for a guy in a wheelchair, Lennox muttered. The sergeant's eyes widened a fraction, and then he shook his head. Sorry, he said in a low voice. I didn't realize. I know, came the reply. He'll be okay. He's got two friends that can help him. If he was by himself, he would have been boned, but I'm grateful to the others. I'm more hoping they're not having to fight through significant opposition. An hour is a good window, but if each of the floors is packed with those things... He shook his head. It wasn't the time to be pessimistic. Jax had said he'd make it work. You better, buddy, he prayed silently. I want to see your face after all this. Here we are. Miller said, motioning to a cluster of vehicles well behind the line. Have a rest. Someone will grab you some food and water. He clasped his hands in front of him. Thank you for the warning, for making it all the way out here. We would have been... well, you know. Lennox nodded as he sat down, taking a load off. You can thank Jax when he gets here safely, he said. The sergeant nodded and headed back to the barricade, leaving the tired man to close his eyes leaning back against a large truck tire. And you better get here safely, buddy. Chapter 9
Jax watched with trepidation as Skylar reached for the doorknob, but froze at the sound of hands smacking the other side. Shit, of course, she muttered. The noise they'd made in the stairwell had been bound to attract attention. As if on cue, there was a series of clatters from downstairs, and resounding hungry moans echoed in victory. The zombies had busted the barricade at the bottom. No going back now, Marcus said, and turned around to shove some of the furniture back in place to hopefully stem them from making it up to their landing. Jax held on tight, keeping himself from choking his friend, but still unused to the feeling of being suspended on his back. It was strange being wrapped up in the weird burrito seat. Skylar turned to them. Grab that coffee table, she said, pointing at the table she'd used as a shield when she was first stabbing zombies. Marcus passed it over and then bent to heave a recliner down into the hole they'd made when they were climbing up. Jax tried to keep his breathing steady as his ride moved this way and that. He'd heard that when you were a passenger on a motorcycle, you had to just go with the lean or else you could throw off the equilibrium of the vehicle. He tried to do that here, not too stiff, but not too limp. Just go with the movement to make it easier on Marcus. They turned back to Skylar, who was positioning the coffee table on its end next to the door. Okay, you brace the door and don't let it open wider than the table, she instructed. If there's only a few, I'll get them over the edge, and if there's a ton, we'll shut the door and reevaluate. Deal? Jax shook his head, but Marcus just said, Yep, let's do it, and stood behind the door, bracing himself as he wrapped his hand around the handle. Jax held his breath. He wanted to ask, What's the difference between a few and a ton? He always had questions, but now wasn't the time. These two were saving his ass, when they could have left him behind to die. He wasn't about to start questioning their methods. Seeing Skylar grabbed by that zombie had turned his chest to ice. He'd thought for sure they were going to lose her. He had the fleeting thought that he needed to learn to trust these two, because they went with their guts, and it seemed to work out. Plus, there were even more flesh-eating monsters coming up from the bottom, and he wasn't sure if that barricade was going to hold. The only way out was up, so taking stock over a coffee table would have to do. Go, Skylar declared, and Marcus turned the knob. The weight on the door was immediate, and he threw himself back against it, struggling to keep it closed enough that his girlfriend could keep the coffee table in place. She stabbed two ghouls in the face in quick succession, splattering gooey, half-coagulated blood all over the place. More arms reached through the gap, clawing for her face. How's it look? Marcus grunted as he pressed against the door feet planted firmly on the cement of the stairwell landing. Just two more, Skylar growled as she hacked and slashed, trying to knock the arms aside to get to the heads behind them. Jax gripped his meat tenderizer and brought it down on one of the arms, snapping the elbow at an unnatural angle. The rotted hand hung limp and useless, unable to block her way, and she nodded at him in thanks. He took out another arm, and then she managed to stab the one with functional limbs, dropping it with its brethren. He considered giving her the gun, but the noise would just draw more of them to the door, and they needed to at least try to get in without thirty ghouls right on top of them. Speaking of ghouls on top of them, the stairwell zombies had reached the barricade, and furniture was shifting under their excitement. Jax swallowed hard. It wouldn't hold for long. Okay, open a little more. Skylar said as the last one fell, and she pushed inside, using the coffee table like a shield. Stay quiet, she whispered. Mark leaned down, making Jax's stomach lurch, and shoved two of the bodies out of the way, so they could secure the door behind them. He locked it, just in case, and Jax let out a deep breath he hadn't realized he'd been holding. One dangerous section down, two to go. Well, three if they counted the terrace which he figured for the sake of realism he should. Better to expect the worst, really. Speaking of the worst, this penthouse had been a party. There were easily twenty-five to thirty ghouls just on this floor, let alone on the second. They would need to get through them to the staircase on the far end. At least the entire one wall was glass from floor to ceiling, so they could see by the light of the bright moon. 
He gripped the gun and mallet like a lifeline. He had five bullets left, and he had to make them count. He'd lucked out being able to shoot that zombie at close enough range it was impossible to miss, but making noise was a last resort, and wouldn't be worth it if it wasn't a sure shot. Sweat dripped down the back of his neck, from pure nervousness, but also from being duct-taped inside a thick comforter. Skylar stepped forward slowly, holding the table out in front of her, keeping her footsteps flat and soundless. It wasn't going to matter in a few moments, as they were going to have to go right through the center of the pack to make it. Something brushed against Jack's and his brow furrowed. Was Marcus? He turned his head and his eyes widened when he realized a zombie was gnawing at his lower back. Thankfully, the comforter was thick enough, working in his favor, because the teeth didn't pierce it. But it was disconcerting, to say the least. A low moan began deep in his throat, and he patted Marcus's shoulder frantically. He could try to smack it with the meat tenderizer, but he didn't think his arm would bend that way. Marcus turned to look at him, but he seemed reluctant to look away from Skylar, who crept forward continually with her shield. There's a... it's trying to eat my back, Jax whispered as quietly as he could into Marcus's ear. His eyes widened, and he reached out to tap Skylar on the shoulder. She paused and glanced back at him and he gently maneuvered so that she had a full view of the ghoul latched onto Jax's back. She lashed out with her knife, stabbing it in the temple, and gently lowered the corpse to the floor so that it wouldn't make too much noise. Ugh, Jax murmured. It was too late. The zombies inside were taking notice of them. Skylar swallowed hard, and then grabbed the coffee table, turning it sideways. I'm just going to push through, she said. Stay close behind me. We'll just shove our way through to the stairs. Marcus nodded jerkily. Okay, okay, he replied breathily, as if psyching himself up. Go, Skylar hissed, and then darted forward. Marcus took off hot on her heels, and Jax gripped his weapons with white knuckles, eyes darting around everywhere to try to keep tabs on the ghouls. It was difficult, bouncing as he was, but as corpses flew left and right from the coffee table battering ram, Others swarmed behind them. He finally accepted his fate of not being able to fight, and just curled his head down, holding on to Marcus and trying to be as light of a backpack as possible. He could feel them on his back. He didn't know if it was hands or mouths, but he knew they were there, dragging at him. He wished fleetingly that he'd had one of the knives, so that if things got dicey he could cut himself free and let the others save themselves but realized that Marcus had probably engineered that on purpose. He knew that Jax wouldn't pull the trigger on himself back there and risk being dead weight on Marcus's back, so he'd been given the gun and the meat tenderizer. There was no escape. All he could do was hold on and trust his friends, and hope that they didn't die because of him. Eventually Skylar stopped, having to use her coffee table to bat zombies away from her, she shifted it over to one hand and slashed wildly with her knife with the other. Marcus stabbed a zombie in the face, kicking it in the chest to dislodge it from his blade, but his movements were slower, sluggish. He was either getting tired, having a hard time moving with his jack's pack, or there were too many zombies weighing them down clutching to his back. Or all three things. Jax wanted to start swinging, but he was afraid that if Marcus moved too fast— or in a direction he wasn't expecting, that he'd accidentally smack him in the face. He reached back and swung behind him, trying to hit something, anything. But the ghouls were all lower than his area of reach. Skylar let out a yell of frustration, and Marcus swung to see her swing the coffee table in a mighty arc, taking the head of a ghoul clean off. Let's go! she screamed and tore for the staircase. Marcus ran, his quick sprint shaking all but one of the ghouls, the corpse flailing around behind them as he took off. They reached the stairs, and thankfully there were none right at the top, so they barreled up. Or at least, Skylar did. Marcus struggled, grabbing the railing and trying to drag his way up the stairs. There's a zombie on my back, Jax called to her, and she thundered back down the steps, kicking viciously at the barnacle corpse behind him. It took two kicks, but the ghoul finally dislodged, falling down the stairs like a ragdoll. Come on, she urged, grabbing Marcus's free arm and helping him up the rest of the staircase. We have to block them. 
She huffed as the ghouls below began to crawl up the stairs. Jax pointed to a sofa near that looked just about the right width to block it off. There! he cried. Skylar ran around the back of it and shoved. Marcus grabbed the closest side and pulled, and between the two of them they heaved it to the staircase. The zombies were about halfway up now, and Marcus got out of the way, joining his girlfriend on the other side. They pushed until the couch got stuck at the mouth of the staircase. Harder, she shrieked, and they gave it another good heave at the same time, stuffing the overly fluffy sofa into the gap, blocking the top half of the staircase. It worked like a plug, and perhaps wouldn't hold forever, but hopefully long enough for them to get to the terrace. The home bar and rec room sprawled across half of the floor, the rest a glass wall looking out over the terrace proper. There was a pool and a decent amount of zombies milling about, or at least, they had been milling about. Now that they'd heard the commotion, they were turning and heading towards the open patio door. The stairs to the roof are out there, huh? Marcus huffed, and Jax nodded. They sure are, he replied. Skylar leaned against the wall for a moment. Catch your breath, boys, she said. We need another plan. Chapter 10 We're going to need to take them all out. Skylar said. Otherwise, if we get up there before the helicopter shows up, they'll follow us up. Jack shook his head. Unless we can lock a few in here, he pointed out. Maybe, Marcus added, chewing his bottom lip. But the more come in here, the harder it's going to be for us to get out. He pushed the image of Skylar struggling in the death grip of a zombie from his mind. He had to focus. They were almost there. He tightened his grip on his knives. He was tired. Sure, they'd run marathons together, but never wearing humans on their backs. It was definitely a workout. He had a feeling his back would be feeling this for a while once they made it out of here. If we make it out of here, he thought, but then pushed that away too. They were going to make it. They had to. You okay back there? he asked, and felt his friend shift on his shoulders as he nodded. Yeah, don't worry about me, Jax replied. Skylar raised the coffee table shield and turned towards the patio. We've got to do this, and now, she said, motioning to the door with her knife. Some of the zombies had reached the door. One went splash into the pool and Marcus cocked a brow. If we can get them in the pool, they'll be stuck, he suggested, as he walked in step with her, readying his knives. Good call, she agreed. Let's take them one at a time, at least as best we can. He could hear the little tremble in her voice. He knew his girl. She was tough as nails, but was just as worried about him as he was about her. We got this, he said firmly, and she threw a smile over her shoulder at him. Yeah, we do, she agreed, and then rushed the door with renewed vigor. Marcus hadn't expected that and broke into a sprint to catch up to her. She stabbed one of the zombies and shoved the rest back through the door with the coffee table. It was just long enough to block the opening, but she had to keep her head back to avoid the gnashing teeth. She held it at neck height, giving him easy access to corpse eyeballs for skewering. Skylar suddenly shrieked and he looked down to see one of them crawling under the makeshift barrier. Its legs gnawed to complete nothingness. It must have been one of the last to die, eaten by too many mouths. It held fast to her ankle, and she tried to kick at it but was focused on holding the table up. Marcus knelt, slamming his knife through the top of its skull. He tried to wrench it free, but it didn't come easily. He put his foot against its head to brace it, and gagged at the feeling of squish beneath his shoe. It didn't matter how long he spent fighting the dead. He couldn't imagine ever getting used to the putridity of rotted corpses. There were two left on the other side of the table, and he popped back up, nearly losing his balance as Jax inadvertently sat backwards on the upswing. He corrected himself, but Marcus stumbled and bumped into Skylar. It was enough to slide the coffee table from the doorframe, and she staggered forward as the table slipped. Marcus made a mad grab for her, but his hands caught nothing but air as she tumbled out of the patio door. The coffee table bowled over the two zombies, and she reacted fast, rolling away to avoid getting bit in the face. Marcus darted forward, pressing down on the table with his foot to keep the two zombies pinned. Get them! 
he cried as they thrashed and snarled. He didn't know how long he could hold them down for. Skylar scrambled to her knees and lunged forward, stabbing each of them in turn, letting out a sigh of relief as they fell limp. The relief was short-lived, however, as a ghoul staggered dangerously close to his kneeling girlfriend. Marcus threw himself over her, launching into the air, straight into the zombie's chest. Jax yelled in alarm as they flew through the air, straight into the pool. The deep end, of course, they'd ended up in the deep end, with a thrashing corpse. Marcus kicked away from it, knowing that breaching the water was more important than fighting the ghoul down here. He hoped that Jax had been able to take a deep breath, but he didn't want to keep him under the water too long. He swam as hard as he could, feeling the weight of the comforter wrapped man on his back. This is going to be heavy as hell when I get out, he thought bitterly. His momentum slowed significantly, and his lungs burned when he realized the corpse had grabbed a hold of his leg. Can we catch a fucking break? He kicked back as hard as he could, and then finally breached the water. Jax didn't make any noise behind him, and his heart raced as he struggled to swim for the side of the pool. Skylar was a few feet away, battling a duo of zombies with all she was worth, blood flying everywhere as she slashed with the knife, removing limbs that dropped to the patio with wet smacks. Marcus's fingers brushed the edge of the pool, but he didn't quite get a grip. Damn it, damn it, I'm so damn heavy, he thought frantically, splashing wildly. He kicked again with his free leg at the zombie's arm holding him back, but he couldn't get enough momentum with the resistance of the water. He finally grasped the edge of the pool with his fingertips and pulled as hard as he could, hoping to hell that he could get a grip on the rough cement. There was a mighty splash, and he saw Skylar tearing over to him, having shoved a zombie into the shallow end. She skidded to a stop, nearly falling over when she reached Marcus, dropping her knife and grabbing his arm with both hands. Is Jax okay? he demanded as she pulled him up. She grunted as she heaved him out onto the concrete grabbing his shoulders to help them out. I don't know, she huffed. His eyes are closed. Fuck, 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 he thought frantically as he struggled to get out of the water. Things got my leg, he gasped. Skylar leaned down after he was halfway out and pried the corpse's fingers from her lover's ankle. Marcus kicked free, scrambling out of the pool, dripping on his hands and knees. Jack's completely limp, dead weight on his back. Can you give him mouth to mouth? he asked breathlessly. In this position? Skylar swallowed hard, and he couldn't see the cogs turning in her head, wondering the same things he was. If Jax was dead, should they just cut him loose? Could they revive him? Would they have to cut him out of the backpack to revive him? Or more importantly? No time, she snapped, and wrapped her hands around his bicep to help him to his feet. Marcus glanced in the direction she was looking, seeing a quartet of zombies approaching along the side of the pool. He took a deep breath, putting a foot underneath him and pushing up to a standing. The sopping comforter plus Jax's slack form made this difficult, but he made it. Once he was wavering on his feet, Skylar pulled on his arm towards the staircase. We can't leave any walking around, he argued. She shook her head. We need to get Jax to the upper level, she insisted. If they're bottlenecked on the staircase, I can just kick them down and keep stabbing them. Marcus's heart leapt into his throat. That's a dangerous plan, he said. It's our only option, she snapped, and practically dragged him along with them. Come on. They tore for the stairs. A duo of zombies stood at the bottom of it, but she let go of Marcus and didn't break stride, lowering her shoulder and smacking right into one of them. The ghoul flailed its arms as it went sailing over the edge of the eighteen-story building. Marcus braced himself as the other zombie staggered towards him, realizing that he'd left his knives in the pool. With the limp fingers hanging down his chest, he was sure the meat tenderizer and revolver were down there as well. Skylar whirled around, a blood-spattered angel of death, and drove her blade into the ghoul's temple before it could reach him. Come on, she yelled and waved for him to move up the stairs. Marcus grabbed the railings, using his arms to pull himself up as much as his legs. Adrenaline coursed through him, the only thing propelling him through the utter exhaustion weighing him down. He glanced over his shoulder halfway up, looking down at Skylar as she grabbed both railings, 
swinging her legs out to boot a pursuing ghoul in the chest. There were only five left, and they fell over each other like bowling pins as she kicked it down the stairs. Go! she yelled, looking back at him. Marcus didn't want to leave her, but he knew he needed to take care of Jax. The longer they waited, the less effective CPR would be to try to revive him. He hoped the guy had just passed out from shock or something, and that he hadn't inhaled a bunch of water. He reached the top of the stairs and his blood ran cold. Eight zombies turned to face him, mouths open, arms outstretched. Fuck me, he breathed, his heart sinking. He had no weapons. There was a possibly dead man strapped to his back, soaking wet. The love of his life was fighting undead monsters downstairs. Marcus took a second to be overwhelmed by his thoughts, and then frantically began working at the knots in the fabric. In any case, he didn't need to have Jack strapped to him any more. He'd set him down and tried to hold the zombies at bay until Skylar could get up there with her knife. Of course, the fabric had been pulled tight, and now it was wet, and his fingers were wet, and the creatures grew closer and closer. He let out a frustrated scream as he fumbled with the knots, and hopelessness began to creep in. Skylar burst up the stairs, eyes wild and hair askew, knife crimson, as well as most of the rest of her. Marcus stared at her, mind reeling. He needed her to cut Jax loose, but there was no time, and he knew deep in the pit of his stomach that she was going to run for those zombies. The sadness in her eyes told him that she was sorry. Don't do it, he thought, and he wanted to say it out loud, but he knew that if the roles were reversed, he would fight the zombies too. He would try to buy her as much time as he could. She moved then to take off at a sprint, and then froze at a most unreal sound. Helicopter blades, and then the whir of a minigun. Marcus ran for Skylar then, his legs suddenly made of rocket fuel, and crashed into her, knocking the two of them off to the side as the chopper peppered the zombies with bullets. He didn't know if they would have been in the line of fire or not, but he'd reacted instinctually. She yelled something, but he couldn't hear it over the roar of the gun. When it finally stopped, the chopper lowered down onto the roof, and the two of them sat up, Marcus struggling with Jack still sopping wet and draped over him. They stared at the vehicle in shock, both blinking as if in disbelief that they'd been saved, really and truly. A few soldiers jumped down, waving maniacally to them. Skylar leapt to action first, pulling on Marcus's arm to help him to his feet. The adrenaline seemed to leach out of him then, sapped by their impending rescue. His body suddenly realizing that it didn't need to push any more, didn't need to desperately try to survive. One of the soldiers furrowed his brow. What's wrong with Buddy? he asked, motioning to Jax. They fell in the pool, Skylar explained and turned, sliding her knife under one of the fabric straps around Marcus's shoulder. She grunted as the knife failed to easily cut through the thick curtain fabric and another soldier came forward with his own knife to help. Marcus staggered forward as Jax fell free, his body feeling like jelly as the weight left him. Skylar caught him, clutching his shoulders like she never wanted to let go, but he patted her arm gently. I'm okay, he huffed. Help Jax. She nodded and moved over to the still man's side. Is he bit? one of the soldiers asked. Why was he strapped to you? He uses a wheelchair, Skylar replied and we didn't know how else to get him all the way up the stairs. He's not bit. Marcus turned around, watching as the soldier put his fingers to Jax's throat. Please be alive, please, he thought. A mantra in his head to whatever deity could have possibly let the apocalypse happen to the world. The soldier began doing chest compressions, and Skylar swallowed hard, beginning to work at the duct tape with her knife to at least free him from the thick wet comforter. Is he alive? Marcus wanted to yell. Skylar managed to rip all the duct tape open, releasing the wet comforter so the soldier could get a better compression. They waited with bated breath for something, anything. Marcus clenched his jaw. They came all this way, carried him all this way. He saved him from blowing his brains out downstairs just to die here, beneath their rescue helicopter. Jax coughed and sputtered, his body spasming. Oh, thank fuck! Skylar gushed, leaning over him to slick his hair back from his forehead. Jax! Okay, get him into the chopper, one of the soldiers said, waving at them maniacally. 
We don't have much time. He knelt and wrapped a hand around Marcus's bicep, helping him up into the vehicle. Skylar and the soldier who'd saved Jax lifted him, carrying him to the door where two more soldiers helped pull him aboard. As soon as she clambered up, Skylar curled up against Marcus, sliding her arms around his neck and pulling him against her chest. We made it, she said, her lips a hair's breadth from his ear. All he could do was nod against her, pressing his forehead into her throat, relishing in the feel of her pulse. She was alive. They were alive. They'd made it. Chapter 11 The helicopter flew to the north, landing near the interstate, well back from the front line of the barricade. As soon as it touched down, soldiers appeared from all directions to help the civilians down to the ground. Jax couldn't believe he was alive, as two soldiers gently lifted him down and set him into a rolling office chair somebody had provided. He looked around at the world, taking in a painful, ragged breath. He didn't know what had happened when he hit the water, whether the shock had knocked him out or what, but he was damned grateful that Marcus hadn't just left him in that pool, or let him shoot himself, or any of the other ways he could have been abandoned to die that day. Thank you, he said hoarsely, and the soldier smiled at him, patting his shoulder before climbing back into the chopper. As it lifted off, the telltale whistle of missiles cut through the air, and the trio of survivors stared as their home was effectively flattened. It would have been quick, at least, Marcus said darkly. Jax couldn't help but laugh. He didn't know what else to do. Before long, his wheezing giggles caught fire, and the couple standing behind him joined in, the three of them busting a gut and causing more than a few soldiers to eye them, concerned. I can't believe we made it through that, Skylar finally gasped, holding her stomach. I just can't believe it. Marcus shook his head. I can, he declared, kissing her temple. Because we had you. I'm so getting late tonight, she joked. He wavered on his feet. Maybe after I sleep for a good seven days straight, love. Here, a soldier said, shoving another rolling chair behind Marcus. You look like you're about to topple over. Let's have a look at you. Are you the medic? He asked, and motioned to Jax. I think you should check out our buddy here first. He almost drowned. The soldier turned to Jax and knelt down, setting down a metal box. Sorry we didn't have a wheelchair for you, he said, shaking his head. The guys radioed us to see if we could find one, but all we had were a few office chairs. We'll try to find something as fast as possible for you. Man, honestly, I don't care if I have to ride a rocking horse. Jax replied, eyes wide. I'm just happy to be alive right now. The medic chuckled. Fair enough. Jax! Lennox bellowed, rushing over. Man! He leaned down to give his friend a tight hug. Jax laughed, patting him on the back. Good to see you, face to face, he said as Lennox stood back up. Sorry, I'm still damp. You smell like rotten chlorine, Lennox said brightly. Do a triathlon to get to the roof? Pretty much, Jax replied, swallowing hard and wincing at the burn in his throat. Lennox held out a bottle of water. Here, shit, sorry, he gushed, unscrewing the cap. He turned to Skylar and Marcus, pulling out another bottle from the side pocket of his pants. It's warm, but does the trick. Thanks, Skylar said, accepting the bottle and opening it. She held it down to her boyfriend first, but he waved at her to go. She rolled her eyes. Oh no, no, after you, she teased, and took a swig before forcing it into his hands. Skylar and Marcus, right? Lennox prompted, cocking his head at them. She offered a smile. Yes, and you must be Lennox, she replied. It's nice to properly thank you in the flesh for saving our lives. Well, it was Jax that gave me the push to get out here and do it, he replied, shoving his hands into his pockets. And if it weren't for him... I wouldn't have made it this far into the apocalypse. So I suppose everything just comes full circle, huh? Marcus raised his bottle. Damn right it does, he declared. Skylar let out a deep whoosh of breath. You know, I loved that condo, she admitted. But I'm so glad to be on the ground. Agreed, Jax added, taking another sip of water as the medic patted his knee. 
The soldier moved over to Marcus. Looks like you all escaped with a few bumps and bruises, he declared as he checked them over. Nothing a little rest won't fix. Rest sounds good, Skylar replied, giving her boyfriend's shoulder a squeeze. The medic stood up and gave them a nod. You deserve it, he replied. Thank you, the four of you, for getting us the intel on the convention center. You saved a lot of lives today. The quartet murmured responses, and Jack scratched the back of his head. There was a lot of thanks going around, and a lot to be grateful for. There will be a transport here for you soon, the soldier told them, and picked up his kit. Take it easy, you four. He turned and headed back to the front lines. Now, we press on to downtown. The End Up next, as the military closes in on downtown, a small team of soldiers undertake a daring mission to help win the war in Seattle, Part 9.